This may look like street cleaning. It's the absolute reverse. Israeli soldiers are spraying skunk. It looks like a volcano that's just erupting that won't stop. Hello, my name is Stanley Heller. Welcome to The Struggle. The Struggle is shown on over 30 cable stations from Vermont to New York City on the internet at thestruggle.org. Our YouTube channel, Struggle Video Media. We begin with some outrageous video from Hebron, a neighborhood in Palestine, Israel. This may look like street cleaning. It's the absolute reverse. Israeli soldiers are spraying skunk, a horrible smelling sewage and chemical spray. It was supposedly developed as an alternative to shooting into a crowd. But as you can see, there isn't a soul on the street. The Israeli government uses it as collective punishment. The video was obtained by the International Solidarity Movement. It was taken on December 30th, as the ISM describes the incident. When students were leaving school, Israeli forces started throwing stun grenades from the checkpoint the students must cross on their way home. They advanced towards the schools, firing several rounds of tear gas at the students. One school boy was randomly grabbed off the street by border police and taken first to the checkpoint, then to a police station. The 13-year-old student is accused of throwing stones. Then the soldiers began shooting tear gas at anyone left on the streets. Once the streets were empty, Israeli forces drove the skunk truck into the neighborhood, spraying the foul-smelling liquid aimed from large trucks all over the streets. At the time they sprayed the skunk water, the neighborhood was already deserted as clouds of tear gas were still lingering in the streets. Right after, the skunk truck directly targeted a kindergarten and several windows of family homes. The power of the spray can break right through a window, spreading the noxious fluid all over the room. Now from B'Tselem, selections from their videos from 2015. Changing our subject, we move on to a disaster for the whole world, a massive methane leak at a ranch near Los Angeles. We turn now to what's being called the nation's biggest environmental disaster since the 2010 BP oil spill. A runaway natural gas leak above Los Angeles has emitted more than 150 million pounds of methane since late October. Thousands of residents in the community of Porter Ranch have been evacuated. Two schools have been closed and more than 2,000 families forced into temporary housing. The leak is coming from a natural gas storage facility owned by the Southern California Gas Company or SoCal gas. The exact cause is unknown, but it's believed that well casing was breached deep below the ground. Adding to the confusion, the methane is invisible to the eye, so residents can't see the fumes, causing them headaches and nosebleeds.
Methane is a powerful greenhouse gas that contributes to global warming. The leak is so severe, it'll account for one quarter of all California's methane emissions in just one month. SoCal Gas says it could take three to four months to stop it. The company declined our request to be interviewed, but issued a statement saying, quote, SoCal Gas is working as quickly and safely as possible to stop the natural gas leak at its Aliso Canyon storage facility, and we're redoubling our efforts to aggressively address its impact on the community and the environment. Well, for more, we go to Los Angeles. We're joined by Erin Brockovich, the renowned consumer advocate. While a single mother of three working as a legal assistant, she helped win the biggest class action lawsuit in American history. Her story was told in the Oscar-winning film starring Julia Roberts uh, called, well, Erin Brockovich. Um, She's now working to seek justice for victims of the Porter Ranch gas leak. And we're joined by David Balin, president of the Renaissance Homeowners Association, located just outside the breached well site. We don't have that much time. Erin Brockovich, explain why you've gotten involved with this case. Explain it to a global audience. Uh, well, this is something, unfortunately, that I've been doing in my career for 22 years, and that's working in big environmental disasters. And when happens, oftentimes the community will reach out to me. And this one is very close to me because I'm actually their neighbor. I don't live too far from there. And the minute I saw what was going on and hearing from them and what's happening to them, that's just my, my call to action was to get out and see what I could do to help the community. Uh, and David Bailey, could you tell us about w uh, when you first became aware of the problem and what uh, the, the gas company originally told the residents of your community? Absolutely. You know, I can remember like it was yesterday, going back to October 23rd, the afternoon, um, we were, the community was overtaken by noxious gases. Um, the neighbors were reporting, they thought there might be a, a home that had a, a major leak. Uh, we did have the gas company come out. They were completely denying that there was ever a gas leak. They went from home to home to home, um, giving everybody the A-OK. -okay. And, um, you know, the, the gas company didn't admit to having a gas leak until the following Wednesday. That would have put it probably about around the, the 28th of October. Um, I had notified the LAUSD the following Monday, which is October 26th, that there was an issue and that our children needed to be protected. Um, they had inquired to the LAUSD as well as um, SoCal Gas, and they were told that there wasn't a leak as well um, until that Wednesday, Wednesday when everybody was notified that we did have a major leak. Um, a time-lapsed infrared image makes visible the leak of the methane gas. According to California's air quality regulators, the leak accounts for 25 percent of daily greenhouse gas emissions in the state, about the same amount of emissions as driving 160,000 cars for a year or consuming 90 million gallons of gas. Erin Brockovich, you have called this the worst environmental disaster since the BP oil spill of 2010. Talk about the scope of this. The, the scope of it is enormous, and there's another videotape out there that, that really helps us see pollution, because I think we can't see it, so therefore we don't always think that it's real, and it's amazing. It, it looks like a volcano that's just erupting that won't stop. And when you fly over and you have the right lenses and you can, because methane, you know, the gases you can't see. But as they use the right screen, you can actually see that it's like a black plume of smoke through there that just continues to billow out. And the magnitude of it is enormous. You know, BP was something that they couldn't stop, that was way deep in the earth, which is exactly what's happening out here. And as we begin to peel back the uh, layers of the onion, if you will, and find out what happened and why we're in this type of situation, the idea that they have safety valves in place at 8,000 feet down, that Southern Cal gas removed and never replaced, which would have prevented this type of catastrophic disaster, is mind-blowing. And so you're talking billions of cubic feet of gas under there, and all of this methane, day in and day out, is just billowing 
out of this site that's infecting a very large landmass is an ongoing constant assault to the community and a huge square mileage. We're working with experts now to take all of the information so we can actually see an air plume and the magnitude of how far this has gone. But this is gonna continue, it's been going on for months, it's gonna to continue to go on for more months. As you said, it's gonna to contribute to what? One quarter of all those emissions for the state of California. It's outrageous, it's frightening at its best, it's horribly concerning to this community. They are sick and the impacts keep going on and that's what makes it so catastrophic. And it's frightening for us to have a company like this where you can't get down there and you've removed a valve, you didn't replace that valve and you now don't have the ability to stop this for half a year or longer is um, a bad scenario. Brockovich referred to a safety valve 8,000 feet down. The paper, the LA Weekly, got into the details. It seems that in the 1970s, this valve was not working properly. Rather than replace it, they just removed it and bypassed the whole thing. So there's no way to shut it off. And now they have to drill in some kind of operation that will take months to bring the matter under control. This California disaster should give pause to politicians like those in Connecticut who are spending billions to bring more methane, so-called natural gas, into their states. Instead of increasing this meth habit, we should be all going on a crash program towards 100% renewable energy. Now also from Democracy Now!, the treatment of Bo Bergdahl. Is the military justice system bowing to political pressure while covering up major crimes? We look today at two cases in the U.S. military with very different outcomes. The first is the most well-known, involving the alleged desertion by a U.S. soldier in Afghanistan. The second case involves the abuse of prisoners in Afghanistan that resulted in death. This case has received far less attention, and unlike the desertion case, there have been no serious charges raising questions about how the military justice system handles crimes within its ranks. In the first case, Army Sergeant Bo Bergdahl was arraigned this week on charges related to his disappearance from a U.S. base in Afghanistan in 2009. Today, Army Judge Colonel Christopher T. Fredrickson convened an Article 39A arraignment hearing December 22nd on Fort Bragg in the case of U.S. Army versus Sergeant Robert B. Bergdahl. Bergdahl was captured by the Taliban and held for five years, suffering extensive torture. The Taliban freed him last year in exchange for five Guantanamo prisoners. Bergdahl has said he walked off his post in an attempt to reach another U.S. base and report wrongdoing in his unit. He's been ordered to a general court-martial, where he faces a possible life sentence. While Bergdahl is being court-martialed, a group of Navy SEALs who allegedly beat an Afghan detainee to death were not. Just days before Bergdahl's arraignment, a New York Times expose revealed the killing and a possible cover-up that goes up the chain of command. In May 2012, members of a Navy SEAL team abused detainees at an outpost in southern Afghanistan. An internal report says three Navy SEALs dropped heavy stones on the detainees' chests, stomped on their heads, and poured bottles of water on their faces in a modified form of waterboarding. One of the detainees was so badly beaten that he eventually died from his injuries. Four U.S. soldiers reported witnessing the abuse, but Navy commanders chose a closed disciplinary process usually reserved for minor infractions. The SEALs were cleared of any wrongdoing. Two of the SEALs implicated in the abuse of the detainees and their lieutenant have since been promoted. Bo Bergdahl has received far different treatment. His arraignment this week came after Army General Robert Abrams ordered him court-martialed on charges of desertion and misbehavior against the enemy. Abrams' decision came despite the recommendations of two independent Army experts. The Army officer who led the Bergdahl investigation, Major General Kenneth Dahl, testified that imprisoning Bergdahl would be inappropriate after years of Taliban captivity and torture. Dahl also raised concerns about Bergdahl's mental health 
saying he may have been delusional, but that his beliefs about wrongdoing in his unit were sincere. The Army lawyer who presided over Bergdahl's preliminary hearing also recommended against prison and said Bergdahl should go before a special court-martial, whereas maximum possible punishment would be a year of confinement. Critics say General Abrams may have bowed to political pressure. Republicans have denounced Bergdahl since the prisoner swap was reached. Senate Armed Services Committee Chair Senator John McCain has vowed to hold hearings if Bergdahl isn't punished. A recent House Republican probe said the Taliban prisoner exchange violated federal law. And on the campaign trail, frontrunner Donald Trump has called Bergdahl a traitor who should be executed. The search to find Bergdahl involved thousands of soldiers, and Republicans have said several were killed in the process. But the Army's investigation found no evidence to support that claim. And while Bergdahl faces continued Republican-led attacks, the Navy SEAL story has been met by a wall of official silence. For more, we're joined by a former top military lawyer who's criticized the court-martialing of Bo Bergdahl while calling for the Navy SEAL abuse case to be reopened. Rachel Van Landing is a 20-year veteran of the U.S. Air Force, where she served as a military lawyer. From 2006 to 2010, she served as chief legal advisor for international law to U.S. Central Command under Generals Martin Dempsey and David Petraeus. She's now associate professor of law at Southwestern Law School. Welcome to Democracy Now! It's great to have you with us. Well, Professor Van Landingham, why don't you lay out for us this contrast between these two cases, one that's extremely well-known, Bo Bergdahl, and another that many say had been covered up, the case of the Navy SEALs and the death of an Afghan detainee, not to mention the torture of others. Amy, thank you. I think you laid out the facts well at the beginning of this segment. The the concern with Sergeant Bergdahl's case is that it's irrevocably tainted by the improper and, I think, illegal congressional statements, congressional pressure put on the military and the military's top leaders regarding disposition in a current pending military case. When you have the chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee, John McCain, threatening to hold hearings if Sergeant Bergdahl isn't punished, at the same time, the four-star general, who, by the way, must go before the Senate Armed Services Committee for reconfirmation for his next assignment, uh, when, he, when Senator McCain is threatening to, to hold hearings if Sergeant Bergdahl isn't punished, uh, it, it's unclear how that, that general can make any other decision besides to prosecute Sergeant Bergdahl. And Sergeant Bergdahl, of course, uh, deserves individualized justice, justice that's free from pressure from, from Capitol Hill. Of course, Congress has oversight of, of uh, the military justice criminal system, and they're charged by the Constitution to make rules governing the regulation and government of the military. But that's system-wide. They should not be making public statements demanding a particular outcome in an ongoing, an outcome in an ongoing criminal case. So you think Bo Bergdahl should not be court-martialed? Frankly, personally, I do not think he should be court-martialed. The, the issue isn't whether he can be. There's certainly enough evidence that he could be. It's the issue is whether he should be. And we'll never know whether he received fair and appropriate consideration for the extenuating and mitigating circumstances because of the avalanche of congressional pressure. It was not Senator, just Senator McCain. The uh, Office of uh, Legislative Affairs and the Army Legisla Legislative Affairs has received numerous phone calls and letters th since Sergeant Bergdahl was transferred back to U.S. custody, uh, demanding particular outcomes in his case. And that's just—it's really unheard of, and it, it, it irrevocably taints the fairness of that decision. But on that decision, there are numerous reasons why an individual should be court-martialed. There are purposes of punishment. And, and the, the commander here, General Abrams, had to weigh those purposes of, of punishment. And it comes down to weighing, to balancing the scales. Sergeant Bergdahl was the Army was criminally neg negligent in bringing Sergeant Bergdahl and en enlisting him and putting him on active duty. He had been discharged two years prior by the Coast Guard for mental health issues. So what does the Army do? They enlist him and they send him to an observation post uh, uh, out in the middle of nowhere in, in Afghanistan on a combat mission. The Army's uh, own psychiatrists have diagnosed Sergeant Bergdahl as having suffered a what they call a severe mental disease or defect at the time that he made the decision, the criminal decision, to leave his post. 
you, but you weigh that decision and those factors and, of course, the huge amount of, of uh, impact that was felt on the, on the unit. The, uh, the thousands of men and women that you mentioned went searching for Sergeant Bergdahl. You weigh that against the the over fi the almost five years of, of torture um, and the lifelong p uh, pain and suffering and impact that Sergeant Bergdahl will will suffer because of his because of his uh, lack of judgment at that time the lack of judgment uh, that apparently was was very much influenced by his mental health condition. It just seems like the purposes of punishment, such as deterrence, rehabilitation, incapacitation, and retribution, are, simply are not there. Rehabilitation and incapacitation are, are off the table. He doesn't need to be kept away from society because he's a threat to society. So this case comes down to deterrence, Amy, and retribution. The loudest deterrent message that could ever be sent was already sent five years ago, when, within a few hours of Sergeant Bergdahl leaving his base, he was captured and subject to horrendous torture. The uh, One of the survival evasion resistance and escape professionals that testified at his preliminary hearing said that Sergeant Bergdahl suffered the worst conditions in over 60 years of any uh, military prisoner, American military prisoner, um, and that he will uh, and that he will have irrevocable uh, lifelong uh, damage because of that. Uh, he also testified that Sergeant Bergdahl honorably tried to escape over 10 times while he was in captivity. And it's part of the American soldier's code of, code of conduct to attempt escape as many and to resist capture uh, while you are ca uh, while you face captivity. And Sergeant Bergdahl honorably did that. So when you balance those scales, it comes down to the sole reason to punish and therefore criminally prosecute Sergeant Bergdahl is retribution. It's eye for an eye. It's just deserts. And hasn't Sergeant Bergdahl faced just deserts, but with over five years, almost five years of torture? Uh, but, however, that question is almost mooted, because one can never can't separate the congressional pressure and the public calls for Sergeant Bergdahl's head made by Congress, Congress that controls the purse strings for the Department of Defense and for the Army, never mind controls the personal fate of the general that's deciding Sergeant Bergdahl's fate. You can't, you can't separate the two. So it seems like it is tainted. And I do hope the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces, who is appropriately charged with uh, day daily oversight of the military justice system, I do hope that they will eventually find that there has been such improper pressure in this case that justice simply cannot be meted out. Even if General Abrams all along wanted to court-martial Sergeant Bergdahl, uh, that decision is not made in a vacuum, and it can't be separated from Capitol Hill's uh, meddling. Season two of the popular podcast serial centers on the story of Army Sergeant Bo Bergdahl. The podcast producers teamed up with filmmaker Mark Ball, writer and producer of The Hurt Locker and Zero Dark Thirty. He's working on a film about Bergdahl and had amassed nearly 25 hours of recorded telephone conversations, which he made available to serial. In this clip, Bergdahl explains to him that he walked away from his outpost in Afghanistan to set off an alert called a dust one or duty status whereabouts unknown, uh, set off when a soldier goes missing. Bergdahl explains he wanted to call attention to bad leadership in his unit. And what I was seeing from my first unit all the way up into Afghanistan, all I was seeing was basically leadership failure to the point that the lives of the guys standing next to me were literally from what I could see, in danger of something seriously going wrong and somebody being killed. Now, as a, as a private first class, nobody is going to listen to me. Of course. So nobody is going to take me serious if I say an investigation needs to be put underway, that this person needs to be psychologically evaluated. Right. A man disappears from a TCP, and a few days later, after test one is called up, he reappears at a FOB. Suddenly, because of the dust one, everybody is alerted. CIA is alerted. The Navy is alerted. The Marines are alerted. Air Force is alerted. Not just Army. Now, that's Bo Bergdahl speaking to Mark Bowl. I want to turn to another clip from the popular podcast serial. In season two, episode two, filmmaker Mark Bowl asks Bo Bergdahl how he explained to the Taliban why he walked away from his outpost. I, I told him I basically was fed up with um, the, the commanders. You, know, you have to remember this is kind of going 
through this is being filtered to the point that you know I'm trying to get guys who barely speak English to understand what I'm you know what I'm saying. Yeah, totally. So, um, so the story was basically along the lines that you know, I was fed up for American commanders because they were like disrespectful, but that didn't work um, because they didn't understand what disrespectful was. So I came up with rude, and they seemed to understand what rude was for some strange reason. Later in the serial podcast, we hear from a member of the Taliban. This is Mujahid Rahman describing his first impressions of Bo Bergdahl in captivity. He couldn't even eat, he couldn't uh, drink or sleep, and um, because uh, uh, he was uh, uh, thinking that uh, what type of people uh, we uh, might be and uh, what are we going to do with him, are we going to um, uh, kill him, um, are we going to behead him, or uh, uh, what are we going to do with him. So uh, that was his situation. He was very scared and uh, weak and confused. So, Professor Rachel Van Landingham, talk about the significance of what we've just heard, these excerpts of the Serial podcast. Oh, well, Amy, I think the significance uh, will be will be uh, seen during Sergeant Bergdahl's uh, court martial uh, this this upcoming year. It's hard to put those totally in context. They do underscore the motive that uh, the investigating officer testified to at the preliminary hearing. That is that the motive was that Sergeant Bergdahl was afraid for his unit, that he wanted to call attention to leadership failures that he thought endangered his unit. Of course, that does not excuse his decision to do it by endangering his unit, uh, but that has to be weighed against his, his five years of captivity uh, and his mental health. TSVN has cooked up this meme about the treatment of Bergdahl. You can see it, copy it on our page, thestruggle.org, in the memes and bit laughs section. Before I go, I want to talk about two new interviews, one with Nidal Batari talking about the situation in Yarmouk camp, the other with Dr. Abraham Weitzfeld, who is living in Nablus, talking about a destructive raid on Tan Weir. Go to our website, thestruggle.org, for details. That's our program for today. See you next week at this time. I'm Stanley Heller, and this is The Struggle. Thank you.